Okay, welcome to Wednesday, March 3rd, our class session, Math 208. And we got hopefully a very focused mission today. And that is the sections 8, 1, 8, 2, and 8, 3. The topic, the overriding topic in all three of those sections are confidence intervals. Estimating something about a population when you only have a sample. And there's three demonstrations, three flavors of that in the first three sections in chapter eight. On our schedule this week, we also have nine one and nine two, but these are basically reading sections where you're getting used to some vocabulary about our next style of estimates, which are called hypothesis tests. So I want you to read sections nine one and nine two. We might talk about them briefly or even mention some of the vocabulary next week. We will when we do the work. But these are sections where you're reading and getting used to the terms that we're going to use next. I want to concentrate on 8, 1, 8, 2, and 8, 3. And for that reason, I wrote down some problems I'd like to do in this session. And uh, let's see what we can get done of these. Maybe Seven's ambitious, and maybe we'll do very, very well. But let's wait and see. Other reminders, and that is Next week is the Delta College spring break. Regardless of where you are or where else you go to school or work, that is March 7 through 13. We have no class sessions or office hours in that week. And our website says that too, but maybe you just out of habit might forget that and that's okay. I am available by email. You can always email me and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And that way you can ask some questions while you're working on stuff, but no formal recordings or office hours during that time. You have next homework due two weeks from last night. So Tuesday, March 16, it's homework number seven, the written homework. There are three problems on that homework. Uh, in this most recent homework you handed in, you only handed in one. So I guess in that way, I'm trying to catch up a little bit. And they are come from a section 8, 1, 8, 2, and 8, 3. So these problems are good practice. You're also trying to keep up in these practice assignments online in the computer system, Newton Alta. So our recommendation, we've given them to you in six blocks throughout the semester. And we've passed the recommended completion date of the first two blocks. There were seven assignments in the first block, five assignments in the second block. Here's five more assignments to make now a total of 17. We recommend you complete that by Monday, March 15. The Newton Alta assignments are 25% of your grade in total. And you can see that on your grade report each time I give it to you. But you can work on all of these assignments up until the last Monday of our semester. So you can always improve in these assignments, but you want to definitely keep up. So you could, I don't wanna encourage you to short yourself on any vacation time whatsoever, but you could work on catching up on some of these. Some people are up on them all, some people are not up on them all, that's, natural, I understand that's natural, but it's going to benefit you greatly if you're up on all these. Okay, next steps. Let's hop right into these problems. So we are estimating, I'll give you the formal words, population parameters, from sample statistics. And you might un worry about where the word statistics came from, but if you go back to the very first section in our book, when you talk about a population, like all the people in the United States and a parameter of the population, like what is the average weight 
of all the people in the United States. If you took all the people in the United States, weighed them all, and then took their average weight, then uh, what would that average weight be? You know, it's an interesting question. Maybe you'd like to know. But it's almost impossible for you to calculate that average weight on any given day because I don't know how you would collect that information for every single person from zero to whatever the oldest person is. But we can have sample statistics. So a parameter is a value you know about a whole population. A statistic is literally a parameter you know about a sample. You could get 100 people lined up, weigh them all, and then use their average weight as an estimate for the average weight of the whole population of the United States. Now, the problem is the sample, we have to be very, very careful about that. And that's not always the main focus of our business. You know, if you went to a elementary school and lined up 100 kids and took their average weight, well, of course you would have a statistic. A statistic is the value or calculation of data about the sample. You might have the average weight of 100 elementary school students, but that would not represent well the average weight of all Americans. Likewise, if you went to the Detroit Lions training camp and lined up just the 100 people, players, coaches, and staff that are there, that also may not be a good estimate for the population of the United States. But, you know, I've got a question, you know, I step on the scale this morning, I weigh 200 pounds. Am I more than the average person or less than the average person? I tend to think I'm more than the average person. And there's a lot of other factors that involve like height and oh, age and things like that. But how do I estimate something about the entire population from just a sample of people? Okay. And one tool to do this, the famous tool that you see often in newspapers or magazine articles or news stories is the confidence interval. So let's just jump right into a demo. Uh, let's try right up there, let's go 99. I got the book in front of me. If you're watching this recording later, it might be helpful to have the book in front of you, but I can also just read the book on the screen with you. It's just hard to keep book and work on the screen at the same time. So I'm gonna show you the book, read the problem with you, and then let's just do it, but I'll do it on the paper and I'll depend on you to keep track of the problem with your own book or possibly with your own book later. So again, when I refer to problem number 99, it's problem number 99 in chapter eight. And specifically it references section eight one, but you'll find it in your book at the end of chapter eight. I'll show it to you right now. Share screen. Let's find the book. Where's the book? Where's the book? Book's over here. And now I'm sharing this page of the book with you. There's page 101. I'd like to do problem 101 later. Let's look at 99. I'll just read it with you. It says camp director is interested in the mean number of letters that mean average number of letters each child sends home during his or her camp session. The population standard deviation is known to be 2.5. That's a measure of the variation of the whole population. Maybe there's a couple hundred kids at this camp. Let's take about a band camp. Maybe there's it's a large camp. I have no idea what camp it could look like. Maybe there's a thousand kids at this camp. It's gonna be hard to keep track of how many letters each one writes home. 
So the camp director takes a survey, picks out 20 campers. Now let's assume that the 20 campers he picked were randomly selected in a legitimate way. So I'm not gonna interfere with that right now. He did not pick or she did not pick just the 20 people who love writing letters or from the other side, hate writing letters. So let's assume in all of our work today that the surveys that we're reading about were done legitimately, there's simple random surveys. Maybe another time we could discuss what happens if we don't believe that the survey was done legitimately. But it says the sample mean is 7.9 with a sample standard deviation of 2.8. So I'm going to write these things down on the paper. The survey sample talked to 20 people. And the question was, or the observation was, letters a camper number of letters a camper writes home during camp and the average number, the mean number, the mean number of the sample for that, we use the symbol X bar was 7.9. And the average or the standard deviation of the sample was 2.8. And they also give you this extra information that the whole population of all the kids at camp they happen to know that the standard deviation is 2.5. Uh, sorry, what does it say? Yes, 2.5. So we're still looking at the book right now. And what I want to say is the first job in this problem was just to read it and put the right information in the right boxes. So part A says, can you tell me what X bar is? You have to know what X bar means. First of all, the sample mean, sample mean was 7.9. I've written that on my paper and we'll go to my paper shortly. They also asked for the standard deviation sigma of the population. And the problem reads two standard deviations to you, 2.5 and 2.8. So you have to know that sigma stands for the population standard deviation. And then you have to read that that's 2.5. N number of people sampled, sample size, that was 20. So now you know how to write down those numbers. Just make sure you put the right numbers in the right boxes. I also wrote down on my paper, the sample standard deviation of 2.8. Whether or not we'll use that, I don't know. Okay, so now I'm gonna take this back to my paper, recording and such but I'm gonna answer questions B, C, D, and E on this problem. So I'm gonna go back to my paper and keep the question in front of me, but it may not be in front of you. So let's get this going here. Good. So the first question they ask you to do is to define x and x bar in words. And I'm gonna to go to the next paper to do that. I'll keep this paper handy. And again, you have to shuffle through the, you can write notes on your paper what numbers I'm writing down, but I can't keep every paper in front of you the whole time. So what, remember, are x and x bar? 
What's his X? What's his X bar? I didn't hear anybody say X. Well, remember, we're doing an experiment here. And the experiment is, in general, I'd like to know how many letters kids write home when they go to camp. So I could define two experiments here. And one of them is going to be hard for me to observe. I'm going to use capital X for both of these. But one of them, I may have a chance of observing. So first, x, the random variable, is the number of letters that each camper writes home during their session. And that's the thing that's almost impossible for me to know unless I physically ask each camper. If there's only 100 kids at the camp, maybe I'll do that. If there's 1,000 kids at the camp, that might take me a while. I may not have time to do that. So this random variable has a mean. And if I want to make sure I'm talking about this random variable, I'll say mean of x. I don't know what it is. It has a standard deviation. And I'm not sure I know what that is either, except they gave it to us. Standard deviation of this variable is 2.5. I'd like to know what's the average number of letters each person writes home. I know that the spread is like plus or minus 2.5 for one standard deviation. Two standard deviations plus or minus five letters. Three standard deviations plus or minus 7.5 letters. Remember, three standard deviations covers about 99% of any normally distributed population. So instead of asking every single person to discover this, I need to ask every single person. I'm rather going to create a different experiment. And that is the mean number or the average number that a sample of 20 students I forgot of letters excuse me I'm going to have to insert that right there of letters that a sample of 20 students writes home during the class session. I also have to advance my paper. And I'll bring this to you in front of you. Writes home during camp session. In short, this is the distribution of the averages of 20 students. I have no chance possibly of surveying all 3,000 kids at camp, but I can survey 20 people properly and then take their average. And maybe their average is gonna stand in well for all the people at camp. I could make it stand in well if I have enough information and I have the right calculation. So the only difference between these two sentences is really the average or mean number and the number of people I interviewed. 
And you know, by the fancy thing we talked about last week called the central limit theorem, the more people I interviewed, the closer my averages will be to what probably is the true number, this unknown number, the truth, if we could figure out what the truth was. So the idea here is that the distribution X bar, I'm gonna use fancy math language right now, should be normal and it should have the same mean as the original distribution, number of letters each camper writes home during their session. But it will have, by the central limit theorem, a standard deviation that's equal to the standard deviation of the first random experiment divided by the square root of the number of people used in the second random experiment. So this is gonna help me out a lot. In English, this means that the result of this second random experiment will have the same mean, but it'll much tighter focus on that mean. The distribution for the first random variable might be a normal distribution centered at mu sub x, but the distribution for the means, the averages of these groups of 20 people will have the same This is not a great curve. We'll have the same mean, but it'll be much tighter on that mean. And what I want to do is find out if I can give you a legitimate estimate of what this unknown mean is. Now, I am spending a lot of time on the setup on this one, because if I set this up really nicely, all the problems we're going to talk about flow in the same way. So the confidence interval is a special calculation and not an impossible calculation that says, if you want to give people an estimate, then you can sample and use the sample mean as your estimate, but you should admit to them that you have a certain amount of error and the book uses EBM to stand for the error bound of the mean, which can be calculated using the standard things we've played with throughout the course. A special z-score, so a special mark on the standard normal distribution. Z-score is called alpha over two. And then this standard deviation of the whole population, which I was given was 2.5, divided by square root of the sum of the people sampled. So this is where I'm gonna get six plus or minus two letters, or you know maybe more precisely 7.3 letters plus or minus 3.1 letters. Let's do this calculation and find out where it is. Now you given sigma x, you're given n, what was the z alpha over two? Remember the z alpha over two is from a standard normal distribution. Standard normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one. Kind of in some sense like the mother of all normal distributions. centered at zero with standard deviation one left and right and two, etc. Z alpha is the number on this line, the Z value, Z alpha over two is the number where I have an area of alpha over two to the right under that curve. I'm gonna calculate this with a calculator in just a second, but your question is, what is the alpha? 
So the alpha is the error that I'm going to allow. We call it the allowed error. I'm going to allow 5% error, 10% error. And this problem in particular says they want a 90% confidence interval. So they want you to be saying that your error is less than 10%. So in my problem here, the alpha is 10%. That's the error I'm going to allow. And for that reason, I could be erring too large or too small, right? So I'm going to look at the standard normal distribution and say I could err too high, 5% on the right, or I could err too low, 5% on the left. But I want to be within that middle, at least decently close to the true average. So let's set this up. 10% allowed error. And that means one minus alpha is 0 0.90. So that's my confidence level. People call that the confidence level. And that's where the name confidence interval comes from. And I need now this Z alpha over two. Now this Z 5%, and I'll write that literally as Z 0 0.05. So I want 5% of the standard normal curve above that point. Now remember, the error is 10%, but I'm splitting the error 5% left and right. Now I'm gonna demonstrate this on the calculator. But we look up this number, it's not hard to look up in a table or in the calculator with the inverse norm command. So I'll show you how to set that up. But first, let's share calculator screen. So I got to get the calculator screen ready. I don't just want to put the calculator into the camera because that's not always excellently visible. So yeah, and I'm, I'm looking at the seven problems I wanted to do, and we'll do what we can do, but I'm going to spend a lot of time setting up this first problem. Okay, must have been working with some other material here, teaching some other class. Got it, got it. Let me get out of there. Mode, function, back, got it, clear, cancel, good and smaller screen and let's go so standard normal distribution remember i can type that into the calculator by going to distributions take the normal probability distribution it's a standard normal distribution number one and I could have the calculator draw that just by putting an X here, zero for mean, one for standard deviation. And then the calculator will put that, oops, sorry, I erased it. Put that on this line, the same thing still exists. And now I can draw it. And a window that's be good for this, minus six to six, yes, I think that's good. Uh, this Y action is too much. Let's go minus 0 0.1 to, ah, sorry, window. I'm doing keystrokes on my board and keystrokes on the screen, and that's not always good. On my screen and on my keyboard, I get two different results. 1.0 and count by 0 0.1. Let's graph that. That's called the standard normal distribution. I counted by tenths. This top of the screen is one. And the so this is one tenth, two tenths, three tenths, four tenths. And I counted left and right by six. Now I want to shade the upper 
and the lower 5% of the area under this bump. The area under this bump is exactly one. So I'm gonna go to distribution and find out by looking at the inverse norm where I can find the upper 5% or the lower 5%. So if I just want 5% of the area to be under that curve, let me get the screen in front of us a little bit nicer, number two. Yeah, if I just want five, upper 5% 5 to be under that curve. This is a standard normal distribution. I just put 5% right here. And I paste that number. That's going to be at 0.5199. Let's go to my graph. I'm a little bit nervous about that number. Doesn't feel good to me. But let's take it. Oh, I don't want the normal CDF, excuse me. I want the inverse normal. That's why that number doesn't feel good to me. So back to distributions, back to inverse normal. Okay, specifically asking me for an area of 0.5% a mean of zero, standard deviation of one, and I got choice on the left or on the right. I'll choose on the right just to see what happens. Okay, now it says 1.6449. So if I go to this calculator, again and calculate the area. Here's the graph. Let's calculate the area. Number seven, 1.6449, 1 1.6449. 1 and above. And above is gonna be upper limit. Let's go all the way to the edge of the screen here, which I have to do is six. You see that's essentially 5% of the area. Now it's gonna be symmetrical. So if I go from the lower end of the screen, minus six to minus one, six, four, four, nine, then I'm gonna get the lower 5% right there. Let's try it again. Calculate number seven area. I'm gonna go minus six. I have to use the minus six on the key on the keypad. That's the thing I keep make, messing up. I have to use the minus sign down here, minus six not the subtraction key over here next to the six. And 1.6449, negative. I even want the negative of that number. Good. There's my lower 5%. So I've got in the center 90% of the curve that's going to give me this estimate number, this one six four four nine, is going to estimate where the upper five percent is above. Now I'll go back to my paper for a second. It's very careful that you want to choose that alpha. Uh, going to go here. Going to go there. Going to make sure I stop sharing the screen. And now I'm nervous that I wasn't sharing the screen. Okay, that's not good. I apologize. Let me go and share the screen, make sure that you see what I was seeing right here. I drew this curve using normal probability distribution function, x zero to one, these instructions are also in your book. And then I graphed the upper 5% and the lower 5% of that curve so that 90% of this curve is in the middle. I found those numbers under the distribution function, under the inverse normal distribution, and I calculated it by saying, Give me the upper 5%, the 5% to the right on that curve. The calculator said 16449. Now I'm gonna go back to my paper. 
it's important that I choose that upper number. This is here at 1.6449. I don't want to use a negative number here, even though this is at negative 1.6449. I want to calculate the error bound with that positive number. So on my calculator, just to put this in there, I did 0 0.05, mean zero, standard deviation one, and I chose on the screen right. I could have also just said inverse norm of 0 0.95 with a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. Some calculators would write it like that. And that would give me the number where 95% is below, which means 5% is above. Okay, so now I'm ready to estimate. Let's go back to my paper. I'm on the paper and let's do the confidence interval. Okay, what was, I'm gonna have 90% confidence that I capture something with this interval. What was the standard mean, the sample mean? X bar minus the error, X bar plus the error. We were given X bar in the problem. And I'm gonna go way back to the beginning of the problem, but we were told that of the 20 people I surveyed, they wrote about 7.9 letters home during that camp session. And it depends on how long the camp session is too, right? But this camp director is only worried about this camp session. We were told that the standard deviation of the whole camp was 2.5 letters. So I can fill this in here. And we know that we surveyed 20 people. This is all I need to fill in the error bound and the confidence interval. The error bound is Z alpha over two, sigma X over M. So the Z alpha over two, now let's do the calculation was 16449. I'm rounding here, not unreasonably. We can talk about how not to round later if you like. The sigma was 2.5. The n is 20, so I need the square root of 20. I'll put this in my calculator and find out what that equals. 1.6449. Sorry, 1.6449. I'm doing this off screen. Times 2.5 divided by square root of 20. And that is 0 0.9195, and it goes on for a long time. Now, I'm going to round that off to 0 0.92. I choose one more digit than I have for this information here. And now I'll present my confidence interval. 7.9 minus 0 0.92 and 7.9 plus 0 0.92. When I actually do that calculation, I get 6.98 to So what does this tell me? This is my 90% confidence interval. For the original sample mean, the number of letters, each camper the sample mean of the original experiment, the number of letters each camper, 
writes home during the camp session. Now there's some special vocabulary you gotta be aware of right here, but this is pretty cool. There might be a thousand kids at that camp. And I've made this estimate that the amount of letters they write home on average, the amount of letters they write home is between 6.98 and 8.82. Now you might be tempted to call that between seven and seven and nine. Now, we're talking about average, so let's say 6.98 to 8.82. But that's a pretty tight range. And so you're within your rights to ask, are you sure about that? And that's what this confidence level expresses. By the calculation right here, by setting the z-score bar out here at the upper five and lower 5%, I am sure that I am fairly sure that I have 90% of the population covered. Now I'm gonna say it this way, 90% confidence interval means we are, let me express it exactly, the book expresses it, we are estimating with 90% confidence that the actual number of letters that a camper writes home on average is between 6.98 and 8.82. So I'm saying that the population mean, excuse me, I gotta keep my paper tilted correctly. I'm expecting that it's between 8.82 and 6.98. Well, that's a very rough thing to say because I could still have an error. What I'm really saying is if I constructed confidence intervals with many, many samples, What kind of samples? Samples of 20 students, because each of my samples had 20 students in here. It's many samples of 20 students that 90% of my intervals would contain the true population mean u sub x. Let's process this. This interval that I constructed was based on one sample, one sample of 20 students. I have no right to say I'm certain that the average is between 6.9 and 9.8. What I'm saying is, I expect that it is. What am I certain about? What I'm certain about is if I asked 20 students and then 20 more students, and if I kept taking random samples of 20 students and making intervals like this, they would all look a little bit like this. What I'm saying is that if I did that over and over again, 90% of my intervals would be winners. 
90% of my intervals would have the true population of mean inside of them. And no more than 10% would fail to have the true population mean. So notice very carefully, I am not guaranteeing that the population mean is between 6.98 and 8.82. I'm just saying that if I did this over and over again, I would win 90% of the time. Now that's a full and careful explanation of the confidence interval problem. And what I wanna do is go and do some more problems like this now, but I'm gonna do them a little more hurriedly so we can try to squeeze in some more problems here. So I'm gonna take, so, but this, this style of working with an error bound, now the error bound is gonna look different for different kinds of problems. Now I'll show you a problem from A2, but the style of working says you take an estimate and then you try to figure out what kind of error might be in your estimate. And you have to do that within a certain level of confidence, which describes how much of this curve you're capturing. <coughs> Excuse me. So what problems do I wanna do also on my list here? Sorry to shuffle papers in front of you like this, 110, 111. Let's go look at that because that is a different style of problem. Uh, let's look at 110. I'll bring 110 up on your screen and I'll let that be something we can enter into our calculator. Okay, so uh, 110, let's share book with you now. It's from 8.2. And uh, find the book. Here's the book. And make sure you're seeing what I'm seeing, which is got to be expanded. Here's 110 right there. Okay, Forbes magazine published data on best small firms in 2012. These firms had been publicly traded for at least a year, have a stock price of at least $5 and reported annual revenues between 5 million and 1 billion. So a certain selection of small firms. There might be in the United States or maybe around the world, there might be thousands of these. There might be tens of thousands, might be hundreds. I don't know. I don't know that business thing so much. I'm gonna assume that there's probably at least a couple thousand of those around the world. Maybe even a couple thousand in the United States. So what they wanna know is what the age of the chief executive officer is. Does uh, do better if the chief, if the boss is older, younger, middle, what? They surveyed and asked the chief executive officer, CEO, what their age was. And they got a sample of, what do we got here? Five by six, we have a sample of 30 companies. I can calculate their average age very easily. And then I can say, well, I'm gonna use these 30 companies to represent the average age of all these firms in the world. Well, yeah, I can, but uh, who's to say that it truly represents? Maybe I have to discuss if the average age here is 57. Does that mean I can say all the firms in the world that meet these conditions, the average age of the CEOs is 57? No, it'd be much more reasonable to say the average age of the CEOs might be 57 plus or minus some error. So I wanna construct a confidence interval in problem 110. And I am going to keep this paper in front of me, but I'm gonna go back to my writing paper now. Because I need to put these numbers into a calculator. 
Maybe I'll bring these numbers to a calculator in a second in front of you. But I want what level in this problem? A 90% confidence interval. For the mean, the average age of CEOs of these companies, as was described in the problem. Now let's see what I know and what I don't know. And let's go back to the paper. I know the sample has 30 people in it. I can calculate the mean of the sample. I can calculate the standard deviation. But do you notice that this time they gave me no standard deviation of the whole population? I don't know what the standard deviation of the whole population is. I can calculate. The standard deviation of the sample. But am I allowed in my error bound let me go back to my paper, share with you what I'm writing. Am I allowed in my error bound to use the sample standard deviation in place of the population standard deviation that I used before? The answer is yes, with a modification. I cannot use the z-score here to set this error bound. I have to use a different distribution, an 8.2 uses, describes a different distribution on your calculator. It's called the t-distribution. I need to set up the T distribution, I need to read that from my calculator. And then I can create the error bound of this formula. Now let me run through this very quickly on the calculator and then I'll even import these into the calculator. So what I'm gonna do is take this paper over to the other page so we can read it. And I'm gonna have my calculator on this page and I'm gonna clear these things up and I'm gonna share this whole screen with you while we do this problem. Okay, back, set up, share screen. And let me make sure we land on the screen we want to. So here's my calculator. Remember, I've already graphed a standard distribution right here. But this is not what's called a T distribution. A T distribution is a slight adjustment to this. And so let me draw a T distribution on top of this standard distribution for you. I'll go to my distributions. I'll go to the T distribution right here. This is the T probability density function. And the X value I'll set equal to X again. And the degrees of freedom is referring to the sample size n. So the degrees of freedom is the sample size minus one. So this curve is called, what do I got? 30 in my sample, 29 degrees of freedom. We could talk about that number later. But now let's let the calculator draw this, but I wanna draw it in a different color. Let's draw it in blue. Where's blue? Somewhere. There, just before red. Okay, graph. Let 
here comes the T distribution. It looks very much like that standard distribution. In fact, the only way that I could get you to see the difference is if I zoomed in on this quite a bit. Let's say I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, point five. So let's do this. Let's change the window to minus four to four. And let's change the top number here to 0 0.5. Now graph these two distributions together. Here comes the standard normal distribution in red. Here's the T distribution in blue. You would have a hard time telling the difference between those two. I can trace and tell you the difference so I can calculate the value. Like let's calculate the value at zero. On the red curve, the value at zero is 3989. On the blue curve, the value at zero is 3955. You see that? A difference of 34 thousandths, 34 ten thousandths. But the principle is still the same. I want the upper, lower, and upper and lower 5% tails of this graph. So I can go to the distribution and calculate that. The inverse T value. Well, I don't want to calculate it here, excuse me. I want to calculate it on my screen. What's the inverse T value? And remember, I want 90% confidence interval. So that means alpha is 10%. So that means alpha over two is 5%. I'll write these things on my paper. So I want, let's get the screen that shows me this. Four, I want the area to be 95% to the left. I want 95% of the area to the left. This graph that I'm using has 29 degrees of freedom. And I want to calculate where that number will be. Calculator says 16991. 16991. Now let's go back to the graph and do the area under the blue curve from 16991. Not the red curve, so I use my arrow key to say the blue curve from minus four, that's the edge of the screen on the left, to minus 16991, minus, not that minus key, excuse me, minus 1.6991. Likewise, it's just about 5% of that curve, almost 5%. And then the other side, I'll do the same. Calculate area. I'm just doing this for the visual effect, not for the value of the problem. On the blue curve from 1.6991 all the way up to the right hand side of the screen, which is four. And that is another 5%. So I need to use this T alpha over two, this T with a 5% tail, 1.6991 to construct my confidence interval. Okay, now let's go back to my paper. Back to the paper, I still need to fill out what? I still need to fill out what S is. I know N is 30. But now I need the sample standard deviation. So you know what I have to do. I have to put these numbers into the calculator. So I'm going to move the numbers over on my screen, move the calculator over here, kind of shrink the calculator so I can read those numbers while I am working on this problem and, and put them into the calculator. So stats, edit, get rid of this list. And type in these 30 numbers, 48, 58. It's gonna take me a second, but this is the way you'd have to do it yourself. 51, 61, make sure I type them in right. 56, 59, 74, 63, 53, 
50, that's my 10th number. Now, 59, oops, not nine, 59. Let me try to enter those a little faster. Which you can do without your talking. Okay, I've certainly entered 30 numbers. So if I enter these 30 numbers, let's scan them quickly. 48, 58, 51, 61, 56, checking for accuracy. 59, 74, 63, 53, 50, 59. Yes, 60, 60, 57, 46, 55, 63, 57, 47, 55, 57, 43, 61, 62, 49, 67, 67, 55, 55, 49. Okay, I think I got the right numbers. So now I'm gonna do stats, calculate, one variable statistics. There's no frequency list here, I'll leave that blank. Now I have my standard deviation, 6.90, figure out how many digits I want to use here. And now I can calculate my error bound. So I'm going to go back to my paper. Find my paper, calculate the error bound. So this is really important. This is much more realistic problem. Why should I know the standard deviation of the whole population of companies on the planet in these category, right? I can certainly take the standard deviation of the 30 that I sampled. Can I use that for my error bound? Yes, if I change the Z alpha over two to T alpha over two. And from the calculator, it's not much difference. Now I'll tell you that when the sample size is relatively large, like 30, then the difference between Z alpha over two and T alpha over two is very small, but if I was only sampling 10 of the companies, this curve, this distribution, the T distribution would look different. And that's the problem. If I have a smaller sample, I need to be more accurate with this multiplier here. So let's take the 1.6991, multiply by the standard deviation 6.9067. I know I'm rounding off, divide by the square root of 30, but I'll probably be accurate enough with four digits here. I can do this without rounding off at all by using all the numbers on the calculator. And the calculator has some built-in features to help you do that, which I could show you later. But let's just crank these numbers right here and see what error bound I have. 1.6991, right now I'm off screen just so I can type fast. 6.9067. divided by square root of 30. Okay, good. What do we got here? 2.1425. Now that's interesting. Oh, by the way, I don't know what the average age of my 30 CEOs was. I go back to my calculator screen to find out. The average age of those 30 CEOs was 56.57. How many digits of accuracy should I use here? Well, let's use 56.57 and 2.14 for my confidence interval. X bar minus error bound, X bar plus error bound. So I have 56.57 minus 2.14 and 56.57 plus 
2.14. That's not a bad spread here. So let's subtract. I get 54.43 and 58.71. That is my 90% confidence interval. Let me write the interpretation down carefully. How do I want to express this? And the book shows you how to write these sentences in each of these sections. So the nicest way to say this is to say, I estimate or we estimate with 90% confidence that the true average age of these CEOs, of these chief executive officers is between 54.43 and 58.71. That's the interpretation. Now notice, I am not guaranteeing that the age of the CEOs is in there. So what, are, what should I do for these high powered companies? The CEOs are between 54 and 59 years old, approximately. So not too young, not too old. They need some experience. They need some, I don't know what cliche I want to use. Experience and energy. I have no idea what it takes to run a company. So notice I'm not promising it. I'm estimating with 95% confidence. What does that mean? If I took 30 company samples, if I kept sampling 30 companies at a time, and making intervals like this over and over and over again, 90% of my intervals would have the true average age. I left out the word age. 90% of my intervals would have the true average age. So I have 90% confidence that the average age is between those two numbers. That's pretty cool because I just said something about maybe thousands of companies just by taking a sample of 30 companies. Now remember, it's gotta be a legitimate random sample, but right now we're not controlling that. We're just accepting that the people that gave us those numbers did a legitimate random sample. Of course, if they didn't, we might be misled, right? So I'm depending on that they did a legitimate random sample. Okay, we're doing good for problems. We're not doing good for time. What I did now is give you an example of this problem and an example of this problem. I want to give you examples of the other problems here too. And it's not gonna happen in the next minute, in the next 50 seconds. So later this evening, what I'll do is do this style of problem. And I wanna hope that what I lack in quantity, maybe I'll do another one of these here too. What I lack in quantity, I made up for in quality, trying to explain these as carefully as I could. And if you like the video and you want to see other ones, you could request other videos here too. You can run these against your homework problems. The homework you're working on right now is one example from 8.1, one example from 8.2, and one example from 8.3. I even told you what examples they were. I may have altered the problem slightly. Okay, this is something of a compromise. So I apologize 
I couldn't do lots of problems, but hopefully I did some problems well. Hopefully I did two problems very well. Now, uh, let me see what I'm going to do right here. I got to get to another meeting shortly. I'm going to end this recording and then get to the other meeting. Uh, so I'll see you later. I'm going to end this recording. If you want to hang out for just a minute or two and ask a question after I end the recording, that's fine with me, but then I got to move along. So you guys have a good weekend. You have a good break. Enjoy your break, but spend a little time working on this and catching up on some problems. See you later.